which is going to be on page 203 of the PDF. Here we go. Chapter 11 is called Pull a Handful from the Army, which uh, if you've been with us up to this point, you already know what that means and you know that this isn't going to go well. <laughs> Oh uh, boy. See, there was a reason that Mao told people not to criticize the army. This is why. You'll find out why. <clears throat> we already found out a little bit, a little bit of why, you know. Because <sighs> the whole warlord incident, the Wuhan incident, you know. We already know about that now, okay. It's gonna get worse. Alright. Let's begin. When Wang Li, then at the pinnacle of his fame and influence, urged Kuai Dafu to launch a campaign against key leaders of the People's Liberation Army, Kuai went quickly into action. He called joint meetings of the rebel heads from other schools to clarify the pullout task and reorganized the regiment in order to turn its face outward. Please just use a condom. Come on, y'all. Please. <sighs> A Department of External Affairs was set up with Run- oh god. Run Chuanzhong. Probably not even close. As head, backed up by ten vice heads. The military information group's correspondents already in the provinces turned their headquarters into liaison centers- or sorry, stations, although the- sorry, altogether the regiment set up 47, and over 2,000 students went out to man them. By the time of the August 1st Red Flag editorial, calling on the revolutionaries of the whole nation to pull a handful from the army as the central task of the day, the regiment forces were already in position to take the lead. Kauai, starting in his or in front of his military map like a commander, sorry, sitting in front, god I can't read! What the fuck, I am so dyslexic, what the fuck? <sighs> Oh my god. Not a good start, y'all. Not a good start. This is worse than usual. Give me the caffeine. Maybe that'll help. <clears throat> Alright, let's try this again. Kauai, sitting in front of his military map like a commanding general at staff headquarters, sent a stream of cables and letters to the far corners of the land. <laughs> naming targets, suggesting strategies, prodding laggards, and appraising activists. At this time, Kwai's prestige was such that his words carried as much, if not more, weight than those of many members of the Central Committee, dear lord, which most militants assumed he was defending, and Kwai had only to suggest an issue or a campaign to stir enormous activity in any region. Once again, if you've been with us up to this point, you, you are going to realize that that is a bad thing. <laughs> oh boy. In order to enrich his knowledge of military affairs, Kwai authorized a raid on the home of Xu Xiangqian, one of the PLA's ten marshals and a vice chairman of the military commission, a man whose great revolutionary record went all the way back to 1935, when he commanded the 1st Regiment of the North China Workers and Peasants Red Army. The guards at Xu's house refused to let Kwai's iron rods in. They went over the wall in secret and seized four big and three small safes full of material, much of it classified. All this they took back to the campus to study. Yo, okay, so in America, uh... <laughs> oh boy. <clears throat> so in America, we have... We have a couple of universities in Tejas, okay, that uh, are very big rivals, okay, and at some point they started stealing shit from each other. So, so, so one of the universities put whatever the shit was in the ROTC headquarters, like in the ar in the armory, in the ROTC is armory. Okay, they like locked it up with all the guns. Uh, but uh, along the, somewhere along the way, I believe an, ar an actual artillery cannon was uh, was brought out uh, by one of the ROTCs of the uh, the uh, 
universities, things things got they got pretty close to the Cultural Revolution over here too, except that it was a a, a rivalry over sports. America. <laughs> So anyway, so they raided this army guy's house, stole all of his documents, and took it back to their university campus to study them. That's research. That is research, kids. That is real investigative journalism. This is what you should be doing, so-called journalists who just go around and like stand in front of the scene of something after it happened. You know, and like say, well, we're not really sure what is going on, but we have this one person here to interview. Yes, yes, sir. What was? What did you see? Oh man, dude, I saw like the wildest shit. Dude, there was like, it was like this this duck was like walking down the street, and then this this guy was like driving, and he like swerved, and he just like hit this this gaggle of old ladies walking down the sidewalk, dude. It was fucking wild. The duck was okay, though. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Journalism. <laughs> yeah, folks, this is real journalism right here. <laughs> Stealing classified documents from the army. <laughs> That's how you do it. <clears throat> All right. <sighs> when members of the Central Committee heard about the raid, they sent troops from the Beijing Garrison Command to reclaim the safes. They ordered Kwai to return everything and copy nothing, but Kwai delayed as long as possible, locked the door to his headquarters, refused to come out himself, sent other people to negotiate, and in the meantime urged his people to copy as much as they could as fast as they could. Before the soldiers recovered the material, students had copied such sensitive sections as the complete list of 4th Field Army cadres and portions of Xu Xiangqian's wartime diaries. They later used some of this material in communications that were sent far and wide across the country, thus exposing vital military secrets. Ah, the War Thunder Forums of old. In the provinces, Kwai's forces went into action swiftly. On July 27th, one day after Kwai's meeting with Wang Li, Peng Wenin, head of the regiment's first department, arrived in the northeast to mobilize an attack on the military region headquarters there. Charging the local PLA with supporting a faction of conservatives, Peng Wenin's northeastern allies attacked the army's reception station at Shenyang took over the building, drove the army personnel out, and even threw some of them bodily out the windows. Yo, they defenestrated them. Damn. A little harsh, maybe? I don't know. Then they nailed up the doors and barricaded themselves inside. This led the next day to a sharp fight with the opposing student faction, in the course of which four middle school students were killed. When PLA fighters stepped in to stop the bloodshed, Punk accused them of supporting the conservative side. He tried to create a big incident by taking the bodies of the four dead students in their coffins to the military region headquarters for burial. When this did not bring the PLA commanders out, Pung ordered an assault on the headquarters building. He himself, wearing a military helmet, took the lead as dozens of trucks filled with student and worker rebels converged from all sides. Once they took over the building, they raised the flag of the Qinghua Jinggangshan Regiment on the roof. Yo. I, I think they're going a bit too far. Just a bit. These violent acts in Shenyang brought criticism from the Central Committee. No shit. But Wang Li, uh, Guan Feng, and Qi Wen Yu praised the young rebels for their militancy and said their main direction was correct. Oh my god. Soon after, Guan Feng called Kwai and announced that he planned a personal tour of the Northeast and wanted two members of the regiment headquarters to go with them. <sighs> 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 All right, uh, 
Sun Tian Long and Ma Xiao Zhuang. Xiao Zhuang? Xiao Zhuang? Oh my god, that, that one's hard to say for me. Jian uh, Long, okay. Xiao Zhuang, okay. Were chosen in order to ensure a tumultuous welcome for Guangfang in the northeast. Kuai cabled his people there to enlarge the incident and sent Fun. This guy again. Chuan Zhong to prepare the ground. I think I got that mostly right. <laughs> Maybe not. Run, head of the regiment's Department of External Affairs, was a skilled organizer. He soon brought fighting to many other areas of the region, including Fushun. There he personally stole a tank from the PLA, from PLA repair shop and led the rebel forces into the streets with machine guns, tanks, and artillery, all seized from the PLA. <clears throat> Not only were many fighters on both sides killed, but hundreds of innocent bystanders lost their lives in the battle. The casualties of the Fushun incident were unprecedented in the whole Cultural Revolution. While Run was doing his utmost to mount an offensive at the scene, Kuai in Beijing called a conference of northeastern rebel heads, denounced the PLA commanders in the northeast as Hulong men, which, uh, so Hulong was Liu Xiaoqi's uh, mil uh, chief military collaborator. Okay, so he's saying that they're, they're, they're like the Shachi people, okay, uh, and urged his listeners to hurry back and pick up their guns. Those who returned to Chongchun, capital of Jilin province, put a 60mm cannon in position to fire on the headquarters there. But the Red Ninth Company of the local PLA rushed its soldiers to the scene. They stood right in front of the gun muzzles and dared the rebels to fire. This so moved many rank-and-file members of the rebel forces that they defected and took the cannon away from those who returned it against the army. Before he could actually depart from the northeast, Guanfeng was exposed as a May 16th conspirator. His plan was a new Liaoshan campaign. In the northeast, went bankrupt, or sorry, his plan for the new Liaoshan campaign in the northeast went bankrupt and the fighting there was brought under control. <sighs> the Liaoshan campaign, which liberated the whole northeast, was fought in 1948. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, anyway. <sighs> Little, little context for this. <sighs> anyway, let's see here. In the southeast, across the strait from Taiwan, Kwai's liaison cadres spread a rumor that Commander Han Xianchu was against German Mao. They issued leaflets which asked, Which headquarters does Han belong to? When Kong Sheng of the Political Bureau of the Central Committee saw these leaflets, he said, People without hate for the revolution can never write such things. Zhou Enlai's reaction was, These people cannot be revolutionaries, they must be counter revolutionaries. But Wang Li and Qi Ben Yu supported Kuai, as usual. If Han has made mistakes, you can bombard him, said Qi. PLA Chief of Staff Yang Cheng Wu said, If you want to overthrow Han, I support you. Oh, boy. So, slogans such as Down with Han Xiangchu filled the air over Qinmen and Matsu. When the, uh, when the Kuomintang troops on the island heard this, they immediately took up the, try, or the cry, sorry, for it called for the overthrow of the military commander, most dangerous to them. Then, of course, the revolutionaries in the mainland, hearing their own words thrown back by the Kuomintang, gave the matter second thought, and many of them opted out of the whole campaign. Obviously, as the premier said, to oppose Han is to help Chiang Kai-shek. Th thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Good enough. It worked, I assume. Kwai's lieutenants sparked major campaigns in the northeast end, uh, or end in Fujian, but the heart of their drive against the army centered on Nanjing, where Xu Xiao commanded the military region. The vice commander was a man named Du Feng Ping. Yeah. Uh, hold on. I have an email. Why do I have an email at 1 a.m.? Amazon.com. Oh. Uh -uh. Okay. And it's scheduled maintenance for something else. Okay. <sighs> okay. <gasps> All right, let's hear it. <clears throat> 
All right. Where were we? Do fun thing. Right. Okay. Okay. So they're in Nanjing, where Xuxiu commanded a uh, the military region okay the vice commander was a man named du feng ping he had earlier established ties with wang li guan feng and chi ben yu and he led a large rebel movement which unilaterally seized power in the city and then went on to demand the overthrow of xu the du feng ping group was called the excellent faction because after it seized power its members declared that their situation was excellent the opposition, which had been defeated and driven from the city, was known as the Make Wind or Fart Faction because its members had responded in disgust to the cries of Excellent, Excellent, with your worse than a bunch of dogs making wind. We've, we've, we've gone all the way down to the middle school level insults, I see. <laughs> yeah, well, you smell like dog farts. <laughs> you are, but what am I? Late in July, after Wang Li said that Xu Xiao uh, must be overthrown, Kuai Dafu himself went to Nanjing to confer with Du Fengping. Du Fengping, oh my god. He then assigned several hundred Jinghua regiment stalwarts to the region. They urged the excellent faction to study the spirit of the Beijing masses who were surrounding Zhong Nanhai. Then, with the help of Kwai's rods, the excellent leaders launched a campaign against the military region headquarters. Several hundred thousand people went into the streets and stayed there for several weeks. Vanguard detachments actually broke into the headquarters yard and occupied it for a whole month. They also broke into the headquarters building and beat up PLA soldiers and staff. Intensive research into Xu Xiao's record unearthed no serious problems which could be used as a basis for the attack, so the young rebels concentrated instead on trying to provoke an armed reaction to their incursions. the entire this entire chapter is just face palm after face palm oh boy <laughs> the nanjing pla could then be accused of unwarranted suppression of the mass movement but xu xiu failed to respond fighting began but not between the excellent faction and the pla it began between the excellent faction and the make wind faction which du feng ping accused of preparing a counteroffensive in the countryside where the majority of its members had earlier been driven claiming that the make winds were about to lay siege to the city the excellence attacked with machine guns and hand grenades Armed struggle raged for several days, but in the end, due to the energetic intervention on the part of Zhou Enlai and Jiang Qing, who opposed the campaign to oust Xu and sharply criticized Kuai for centering his attack on the PLA, fighting died down, and the masses in front of the military headquarters were dispersed. Kuai had planned a huge mass meeting against Xu Xiao for the latter part. It's not a Xu, it's not Xu, it's, it's Xu Xiao. Xu Xiao. Oh my god, that is not hard. To, that is not easy to do. The switch from the Xu to the Xu uh, consonants for some reason. That's, that's difficult because they sound a little bit similar, so I guess my brain doesn't want me to switch between them. It wants to use like Xu or like Xi, you know. Xu Xiao. It wants me to say that instead of Xu Xiao, which is, yeah, anyway, this, this, is, this is not easy. Not easy name. <clears throat> anyway, then on September 1st, the regiment liaison station in Nanjing received a telegram from Kuai that said, Xu Xiao is a good comrade. Our liaison station should withdraw from the city. Please publish this widely. 
Kawhi's request for publicity was hardly necessary. The telegraph operator who took the message was from the Make Wind faction, and Kawhi's message was all over the city, before the liaison station or the military region headquarters even received their copies. When it became clear that Mao Zedong and the Central Committee actually stood behind Xu, large numbers of people moved to support him, and posters went up all over the city, announcing adherence to Xu and the Central Committee. During July and August, the Qinghua Fours competed with the regiment in the campaign to pull a handful out of the army. They, they too sent hundreds of activists out to man more than a dozen liaison stations in various parts of the country. As part of this effort, uh, Wang Yongshan went to Nanjing on August 5th as head of the East China Liaison Station. After all the speeches and editorials, I went to Nanjing determined to pull out Xu Xiu, Wang said. But the regiment crowd had already pre-empted the field. Pre-empted the field, rather. They had posters everywhere, proclaiming "Down with Chun Zaidao, Down with Xu Xiu, Xiu 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 Xiu." Oh my God, my mouth can't do this, y'all. Ah, I gotta up my tongue skills. Xiu 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 Xiu. This isn't working, y'all. Shio. <laughs> and her newspaper, or their newspaper, sorry, wrong pronoun, their newspaper, was filled with attacks on Shu. Each new telegram from Kwai stimulated a new high tide of activities, or activity, I love activities, activity, posters, and reinforcements for those surrounding and occupying the military region headquarters. Kwai's first telegram read, Wang Li says there are at least three commanders who oppose Mao Zedong. Xu Xiu, Han Xianchu, and Chen Xilian. It came at midnight, and by dawn the whole city was covered with posters repeating this message. Tian Pu, Xu's wife, went to Beijing to appeal on behalf of her husband, but Wang Li refused to hear her, saying, The case is clear. Kwai sent a second telegram that spelled this out and stimulated a new outburst of anti Xu feeling and action. We fours tried to do our part, but the regiment rods attacked us, saying that we were only against Xu on the surface, while we really supported him in our hearts. So wherever we went, people resented us and treated us coolly. Excellent faction people even grabbed us, beat us, and demanded that we confess our real thinking. When we refused to respond, they put us in trucks, drove way out in the country, and dropped us off one by one in out-of-the-way places. Finally, we decided that since everyone seemed to believe we really supported Shu, maybe we had better turn around and support him, in fact. We debated this for a while and then came out on Shu's side, thus linking up with the make wins. When Kwai's pro Shu telegram came out on September 1st, we were very happy, for we were already on the right side. But it wasn't a matter of principle. We only did it out of factionalism, because we found it hard to agree with the regiment on anything. <laughs> When it came to the sacking of the British mission on August 23rd, based, it was the Fours' role and not the regiment, or sorry, it was the Fours and not the regiment who played the major role. This was because the key group responsible for the affair, the anti-imperialist, anti-revisionist liaison station in the foreign ministry, was linked not to the Heaven faction, but to the Earth faction, and the Fours were part of the Earth faction. The anti-imperialists were left-leaning cadres with ties to Wang Li. With the help of thousands of rebel students from the foreign language schools, they had effectively ousted Zhang Yi as foreign minister and placed Yao Dongcheng, a return charge d'affaires from charge d'affaires from Jakarta in command of foreign affairs. Yao Dongshan had uh, issued an ultimatum to British authorities in Hong Kong, giving them 48 hours to replace several imprisoned Chinese journalists, sorry, release them, or face the consequences. On the day that the ultimatum was to expire, the Tsinghua Fours received a phone call asking them to mobilize for a demonstration in front of the British mission. We, 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 they, they arrested a bunch of Chinese journalists, but, but I thought that British colonial control of Hong Kong was good. What? <clears throat> Fuck the British. God. I, <clears throat> I thought they were democratic. Oh my god. Are 
Are you start? Do you see? Do you are you starting to understand why some people, not necessarily myself, but some people, might end up taking the conclusion that people uh, <laughs> who are against Chinese control of Hong Kong might uh, be coming from mostly a uh, a bourgeois point of view. Are you starting to understand why people might get that impression? Even if it's not necessarily true, it's it's easy to make that impression, okay? Or to get that impression, I'm just saying. Do you get it now? <clears throat> because for a very, very long time, it was. It was just people who wanted to keep British colonial control. <sighs> oh. <clears throat> uh, anyway. <sighs> so. What do they do? Over the loudspeaker, all four supporters were called together for a meeting. A cadre from the anti-imperialist, anti-revisionist liaison station told them, Tonight we are going into action to show the British how tough we can be. After the tempering of the Cultural Revolution, our rebels are strong and angry. During the Cultural Revolution, the British seized and spread a lot of unauthorized information. If they don't answer in time, we'll seize it all back. Bring screwdrivers and pliers. When we get in there, we'll open up the files. Wear black clothes. They might shoot at us. Don't give them a clear target. All those who can read English should strive to be in the vanguard. Bring flashlights. Imagine... Black Block invading an embassy somewhere. <laughs> Just imagine. It's kind of like that. Kind of. <laughs> Not quite the same, but a little similar. A similar idea. The speaker then brought out a map showing where the mission was situated and where the fuse boxes, water pipes, and water tank were. You know, they know what they're doing. <laughs> We were enthusiastic, said Gao of the Force. We sent one big contingent into the city and then decided that wasn't enough, so we sent another. Our forces helped surround the whole place. At first, we were well disciplined. We sat down and orderly rose and listened to five rules set down by the Premier. He said we could protest, protest in writing, hold meetings, etc., but must not break into the grounds. Our protest meeting began at 9 a.m. with denunciations of the British oppression broadcast over the loudspeaker. What are you going to do? We asked again and again. At 10 o'clock, the ultimatum expired. What would happen? We only knew we would show them. Then the PLA men came and surrounded the place. The Premier had said we should not break in. I asked what we should do. The answer I got was that the Premier has to say things like that, but if the masses take revolutionary action, who can prevent it? Based. <laughs> <laughs> the PLA is just like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, the the premier, he's got to say that you can't really go. You know, he he can't he can't just tell you, yeah, sure, go invade the British embassy. But I mean, you know, between us, you know, we're not gonna stop you. <laughs> Based PLA, okay, okay. <laughs> Actually, the break-in had long been planned by people who hoped to overthrow the premier. Of course. Based PLA, not so based quite a foo people. <laughs> Although this is actually not the Kwaidafu people, this is the Force. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is the Earth Faction, my bad. The Geology Institute. Remember, I, I just need to remind y'all. Just, just, just need to remind y'all that all of this, all of this factionalism, everything, all of this struggle is happening because of students at one university. <laughs> That's how it all started. All of these divisions came specifically from the, this one university. 
and it led to like a whole bunch of people murdering each other. So anyway, <clears throat> the activists of the anti-imperialist, anti-revisionist liaison station came up from behind with loudspeakers blurring. Some individuals in front jumped up and threw bottles of ink at the walls and windows on the building. This was a diversion as the ink flew out front. Other roots found their way inside the building from the back. They began throwing chairs and sofas out the windows. The loudspeakers behind us urged us to action. We pushed against the PLA lines, shouting, Back up! Let us in! People over there have already gone in! There were eight lines of soldiers. Some youngsters tried climbing over their heads, but they were thrown down. The soldiers' lines finally broke at one spot. We rushed through, the through to climb the fence. Soldiers pulled some of, some of us down, but the others got over. At eleven, we saw flames. First, the oil barrels in the garage burned. Wait, they have a bunch of oil barrels just sitting around in the embassy, just in case they need to burn the embassy down themselves, I guess. I don't know. Those Brits, they plan for everything. <laughs> then the main gate opened. People rushed in. The cars began to burn. Three mission-owned car three mission -owned cars burned. Fire engines came, but armed people stopped the firemen. <clears throat> they had to withdraw. The flames rose higher. Fire engines returned, lots of them. The firemen pushed through the crowds to get near the building. About the time the fire started, Zhou Enlai and Jiang Qing sent an order to all of us to stop the assault, but it was not broadcast. We didn't hear it until later, but as soon as we did, we all left the area. By then it was too late. We felt very bad. God. I don't know, burning down the British Embassy is pretty much based in any situation, so I'm okay with this, even if it was for incredibly silly reasons. <sighs> well, okay, I mean, actually, okay, actually, in this case, now that I think about it, sorry, I forgot that the British had, like, kidnapped a bunch of Chinese journalists in Hong Kong. Sorry, sorry, I forgot about that. Okay, maybe it's... Maybe it actually is a decent reason in this time. In this time, okay, that's an acceptable reason. <clears throat> anyway, in Minecraft, just just to be clear, just <laughs> when the PLA lines gave way, the British ran into the basement and locked themselves in. Typical Brits, always running away. But people broke in and pulled them out. Police intervened and took the British across the street to the Albanian embassy. The Albanian embassy. Yeah, they they were the Albanian embassy. Yeah, that that sounds about right. Okay, but even as they crossed the streets, some of our people tried to tear their clothes off. Actually, most of us thought this action was not so good. Why should we mount this kind of violence in China? I, it's it's the British. It's 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 fair. <laughs> when we were dispersed. Uh, after the Premier's directive, we all felt that something had gone wrong. How had the building started to burn? We fours had participated from the beginning in what came to be known as a counter-revolutionary incident. After that, many people opposed us, criticized us, and put a lot of pressure on us. We had to criticize ourselves many times, but the regiment was not involved, so they used our mistake to gain ground and put us in a bad light. If the Fours made a serious mistake in joining the attack on the British mission, Kwai Dafu and the regiment made a few of their own, as if they haven't already. <laughs> that they may not have been, or sorry, that may not have been so world renowned, but still damaged them politically. One of these was giving unqualified uh, support to Chun Li Ning, the quote, madman of the modern age. What does that mean? 21st century schizoid man. <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel so old now. <laughs> anyway. Chun Li Ning first came to public attention as the protege of the Red Teachers Union, whose members discovered him confined in an insane asylum when they went to liberate a colleague named Fan Tianxing, uh, who then they claimed had been committed as a dissident. 
They do this in America, in case you're wondering. This is actually quite common in America. <sighs> Throw political activists into asylums and shit. Just lock them up forever. Say that they're insane. <clears throat> Very common here. <sighs> oh, oh, oh boy. They were looking for premature anti Luists, people who had been persecuted for their politics during the years Liu Xiaoqi held power, in order to lend credence to their theory that the revolutionaries of today must be sought among the dissidents of yesterday. Chen Liening fit the bill much better than Fang. A landlord's son, who had been a revolutionary cadre in Xiangtang City, had uh, he had written a long critique of Liu Xiaoqi many years before, only to be hounded from his job and finally incarcerated in an asylum for his pains. The Beijing Security Police told the Red Teachers Union that Chun had written more cogent polemics against Marx, Lenin, and Chairman Mao than he had against Liu. They claimed he was a reactionary who should be indicted for counter-revolutionary agitation if he ever became well enough to leave the asylum. But Song Jingying, a former Kuomintang district leader, now established as the most radical of the Tsinghua teachers, responded by leading an assault on the headquarters of the security police. With the support of hundreds of United Regiment students, this was in January 1967, before the split, the Red Teachers Union had broken into the police offices, seized the telephones, made speeches over the loudspeaker system, urged the prisoners into the, in the municipal jail to rise and break out, ransacked secret files, and made off with a complete dossier of Chen Liening. The Red Teachers Union then took the material on Chun to Wang Li and Xi Ben Yu of the Central Cultural Revolution Group. These two reversed the case for Chun, declared him to be a revolutionary hero, a madman of the modern age, and approved the action of the teachers in liberating him and all his files. The, 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 this nickname is based on the famous Diary of a Madman, in which the author, Lu Xun, lays out a brilliant critique of China's feudal customs and moral standards in the form of the writings of a, quote, madman, in order to avoid persecution and ostracism. Ancient Southwest Asian prophecy. I rest my case. <laughs> <clears throat> ah, yeah, look at that guy. He's just lying on the ground, rolling around naked, spewing out a bunch of meaningless sounds. Is he too among the prophets? <clears throat> <clears throat> he has a bunch of friends doing it too, so they they can't be insane. <laughs> They're prophets. If you do it alone, people think you're insane. If you do it with a bunch of people, people think you might be a prophet. That's the trick. <clears throat> Turns out Saul was not among the prophets, just to be clear. But people keep asking if he too is among the prophets, you know? Like, they keep asking. <laughs> <sighs> According to Wang Li, Chun Liening's attack on Liu Xiaoqi was detailed and well-organized enough to constitute a theoretical contribution to the revolution, whereas his fulminations against Mao Zedong were any rational product of his recurring mental illness. That's a doozy. Oh boy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When he says something that agrees with me, he's... it's fine. When he says something that disagrees with me, it's because he's insane. Typical. Typical. Oh boy. Oh, 
Wang Li therefore gave the Red Teachers Union a green light to suppress Chun's questionable writings, while they compiled his anti-Liu material into a new diary of a madman and issued it in various forms, including popular comic books. On the basis of this published material, some students in Tianjin wrote a play called Madman of the Modern Age, which won acclaim from Wang Li and Xi Pen Yu, and was widely performed in the spring and summer of 1967, first, uh, first in Tianjin and then at Tsinghua and then all over Beijing and North China. Sidney Rittenberg, an American working for Beijing Radio, even raised money among the foreign nationals in the city to put on two performances, especially for foreigners. <coughs> After the play had made him famous as a political prophet, I told you, I told you, my, my analogy to ancient Southwest Asian prophecy was not a joke. It was kind of a joke, but it was, it didn't come from nowhere, okay? God. They're like the angry street preacher, preachers of 2,500 years ago. I'm just saying. That's what they were like. <clears throat> also, Amos is the best prophet. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. After the play had made him famous as a political prophet, Chun Lining appeared in the flesh. I'm sorry. <clears throat> On the Tsinghua campus to recount his long heroic struggle against the Yushachi. I, I will stop. Okay, y'all, I'm sorry, but like every time I see any reference to any, to any dad rock, I'm just... I grew up listening to dad rock. I'm sorry. I'm old. He was thereupon launched on a public career as a lecturer rallying anti-revisionist sentiment at political meetings all over the country. At Xinhua, Kuai Yafu became very active in promoting Cheng Lining. Kuai honored Chun by including him in the Kuai faction and said that he had been a Kuai faction man for 17 years. By definition, a Kuai faction man is a rebel oppressed by Zhu Xiaoqi. Any attack on Chun is an attack on me, said Kuai Dafu in his usual bold and defiant style. But other forces, including certain members of the Beijing security police, kept chipping away at Chun's reputation, reminding all who cared to listen that Chun Lining was a polemicist against the whole socialist system, and not to it, and not just against that revi re revisionist aberration, Liu Xiaoqi. To prove their point, they published some of Chun's anti-Maoist writings. In February 1968, six months after Wang Li had been exposed as a May 16th plotter, and about the same time that Xi Yu was finally removed from office as part of the same conspiracy, the Central Committee declared that Cheng Lining was a counter-revolutionary and that the play Mad Men of the Modern Age was a counter-revolutionary work. Hey captions, could you be a little bit faster? Did you see how slow that was? That was amazingly slow. I feel like the captions are usually much faster than that. It's lagging, y'all. If I talk for like more than 15 seconds, it just starts to lag. See? <laughs> oh, fascinating. Well, we're going to be switching caption services soon anyway, because this one is going to shut down soon. Maybe I'll do it by the next stream, since it's shutting down in like a week. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it by the next stream. We'll switch to something else. We'll figure it out. I might just have to use the OBS Captions plugin that sends it directly to Twitch Captions. It's gonna... I'll just, I'll just get rid of this section here so that people can put the captions there. Gotta leave an empty space, you know, for the captions to go at least. <sighs> anyway. Y'all can't see what I'm doing. I'm pointing with my mouse at the <laughs> captions area on OBS, as if you can see what I'm doing. Anyway, I'm in the, the area where the captions are, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like delete that whole box there and just leave it empty. And then you can put the captions there from the Twitch captions that I'm gonna be switching to, I guess. 
even though the Twitch captions, I'm pretty sure, don't have open dyslexic font available. <sighs> Maybe they do. I don't know. Can you change it? I think you can change it if you use an extension, if you use a browser extension. Like I use, uh, what is it called? For Firefox, I use, I think it's called Mobile Dyslexic. Uh, is what it used to be called at least. Maybe it's changed names. But anyway, it's just a toggle button to try and replace all the text on a page with Open Dyslexic. And uh, it works pretty well. It even changes the YouTube captions to Open Dyslexic, and I think it might change the Twitch captions too. Anyway, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, all right, here we go. So, this decision put Kwai and the regiment in an awkward spot, for it, but its impact was softened somewhat by the fact that Chiba Yu, aware of the way the wind was blowing in the fall of 1967, had backed away from the, quote, madman Chun, had eased him off the public platform, had sent him to Xiangshan Sanatorium on the western hill, in the western hills for arrest, and had finally assigned him a minor research post in the Academy of Sciences. At least they didn't keep him locked up. Slight improvement. Major improvement, actually. <laughs> oh, boy. In the meantime, the play had quietly been dropped. By February 21st, 1968, when the Central Committee made its damaging announcement, Kwai Dafu had already set up an investigation to group to look into the true nature of Chan Bedin. Thus, Kwai could make a case for the idea that he had been fooled uh, all along and that he was an anxious, as anxious as anyone else to get at the truth. Of course. Even as Kwai Dafu backed away from Chen Ling, he took the offensive against the new Revolutionary Committee at the Normal College and linked up with another unsavory character, one Fan Liao, who was uh, trying to overthrow the committee from the inside. On the surface, what Kwai and the Tsinghua regiment, uh, regiment had against the Normal College Revolutionary Committee was that it had been set up by Earth Action Forces. Earth Faction Forces, of course. Not to be confused with the the terrorists of uh, no, not terrorists, terrorists. God, <laughs> captions don't want to say it. Terra, Terra, like Earth, Terra. No, not Tara, Terra, T E R R A, ists. <laughs> Those people from, from Legend of the Galactic Heroes. <laughs> AKA the Earth Cult. <laughs> Terraists is a funnier name, though. <clears throat> no, the, the Earth Faction are not the same as the Earth Cult from, from Legend of the Galactic Heroes, though. I would imagine that uh, there w there might have actually been a slight inspiration there. It's po it's entirely possible uh, that there was a slight inspiration there. I'm not sure. It could be I could be totally wrong, but there was a lot of inspiration from Chinese history in Legend of the Galactic Heroes in general. So, among other places, but yeah. God, Legend of the Galactic Heroes is so fucking good. <laughs> I love I love radical anarchist Young Wen Li. Young, yeah, yeah, that's what his name. that's his name. Young Wen Li, gotta love him. Young willingly, that is not not his name. It's Young Wen Li. Okay, although some people pronounce it Wang Li because they don't know how to pronounce Chinese names. Anyway, oh boy, that was that one was great. Yes, yes. Have you ever, did you watch the prequel OVAs as well? It's like an entire series. It's very long. It's like a, almost the length of the of the main series. Prequel OVAs, yeah, it has like the, uh, for example, the entire anti-eugenics arc uh, that I mentioned previously, where uh, Reinhardt Osama uh, <laughs> goes to a military academy uh, 
and finds out that, that they're all eugenicist assholes. But there's one guy there who's secretly colorblind. They're, they don't let colorblind people into the military, uh, apparently. Um, and he's been... Uh, <laughs> you've been about a month or, a month or three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, this, the, the colorblind guy there. You'll, you'll see. You'll see what I mean. Anyway, that's the anti-eugenics very special episode slash arc. It's a whole arc, actually, where Reinhardt uh, realizes that he hates eugenics. For those who don't know, Legend of the Galactic Heroes is uh well it's there's a whole bunch of things going on but the galactic empire or whatever the fuck they're called <laughs> okay it's one side it's like star wars if star wars actually lived up to its name okay star wars but way better way 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 better <laughs> star wars but actually good <laughs> except not really well it's similar anyway Ugh, it's not the same as star trek very different from Star Trek. Anyway. <sighs> Star Trek is also way better than Star Wars, but they're very different, so you can't really compare them. Anyway, so Legend of the Galactic Heroes. There's one side that's like the Empire, and the other side is the Alliance, okay? The Free Planets Alliance. One caveat of Legend of the Galactic Heroes is that it only has humans. That is true. And they also don't have the Force, but like... It's humans and technology. There's no magic going on, and there's no aliens. Okay. Which is fine. And we treat planets like towns and cities. <laughs> Star Wars basically does that too, though, almost. Not a little bit. It depends on the city, or on the, on the planet, you know. But anyway, yeah, in Legend of the Galactic Heroes, you have... Uh, anyway, so there's... The, the, the Empire is, like, very German very German. It's like a combination of uh, World War One and World War Two Nazi Germany, like, put together. All the worst parts of all of, of both of those things put together is the Galactic Empire, or whatever the fuck they're called. Okay? And, uh, Reinhardt is, like, the main character from there. And then there's the main character from the Free Planets Alliance, which is an ostensibly democratic republic type deal they're they're actually not very democratic you know it turns out but uh <laughs> anyway that the, the other that the admiral over there young wang li is uh <laughs> wang li as they call him in the in the japanese uh original audio i, I don't know how they pronounce it in the dub if they even have a dub but anyway America. So anyway, y'all, no, 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 it's not like America. Okay, it's a little bit like America. But anyway, so you have, in the Galactic Empire, you have the, um, like, Nazi eugenics and, like, all of that shit going on, genocide, all that shit's happening, and then you also have a feudal uh like monarchy system where you have the kaiser in charge of everything and he's he's basically the king you know it's like a combination of nazi germany and world war one germany anyway how do we make nazi germany even worse it's kind of like that almost uh so anyway so reinhardt is the blonde bisexual man uh, he's a twink, kind of. Uh, yeah, he's like a femme twink with long blonde hair, and he's amazing. And he hates eugenics. He he has a he, he well yeah you, you, you just watch the show, okay? Just watch the show. Just watch the show. Is he a good guy? Well, total twink, yes. Yeah. <laughs> As as one character, oh, and he has a he has he has a redhead twink boyfriend and later a butch wife. I love him. Anyway, uh, amazing show. Okay, I'm just gonna continue now. That was too much of an aside. Maybe I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, <sighs> let's go. So what the fuck is going on? Here we go. Okay. <sighs> 
So, on the surface, what Kwai and the Tsinghua Regiment had against the Normal College Revolutionary Committee was that it had been set up by the Earth Faction forces. Acting together with Han Aijing of the Aeronautical Institute and Nie Yuanzi, 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 Nie Yuanzi of Beijing University, Kwai helped bring all the Heaven Faction forces from the schools and colleges of Beijing out to the Normal College campus to demand the overthrow of its new leading body. And he's progressive and cares for his friends. <laughs> and oh my, the places those naturally lead. You may have killed millions of people, but at least you made me happy. <laughs> one of the best, one of the best quotes from the show. <laughs> Liberals, whenever they think about George Bush. <sighs> Junior. <clears throat> well, well, I could have had a beer with him at least. <clears throat> Oh boy. <clears throat> oh boy. Just to be clear, that quote is not about genocide. Okay. There there are genocides in the show. That particular quote is not about anyone who commits genocide. It's about an an admiral in the navy, the space navy. Okay. He didn't drink. <laughs> unlike his counterpart. <laughs> unlike Young over here. Alcohol is humanity's friend. How can I abandon a friend? I love the young so much. I love young so much. I love young so much. Oh my god. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> oh boy. Let's see here. So, acting together with Han Aijing of the Aeronautical Institute and Nie Yuanzi of Beijing University, Kwai helped bring all the Heaven Faction forces from the schools and colleges of Beijing out to the Normal College campus to demand the overthrow of its new leading body. Tens of thousands of people showed up. As they demonstrated, Kwai directed them from the front seat of a jeep that sped from place to place according to the needs of the moment. Also, uh, Oberstein is like. God, I hate Oberstein. What a fucking asshole. The worst part about Oberstein is that he's usually right, but he's a total asshole about it. <laughs> he's, he's such an asshole. Sometimes he's wrong, but he's usually right. <sighs> oh, boy. <clears throat> All right. Mao Zedong and his headquarters group, recognizing this as a test case in a nationwide campaign of ultra-left overthrow attempts, took drastic action. The Beijing security police intervened, uh, arrested three key people, in uh, sorry, including Fan Liao, who was designated a counter-revolutionary, and upheld the Revolutionary Committee. Kawai was severely criticized by the Central Committee members for his provocative role. Under attack for this and similar extreme acts, Kawai finally made a public self-criticism. <laughs> How many years has it been? He spoke before a mass meeting at the university, pretended to be sorry, and left the stage weeping. A few minutes later, he showed up backstage all smiles. A politician must be a good actor. Job Truinet. <laughs> More Legend of the Galactic Heroes references. See, now for the rest of the stream, I'm just going to keep making Legend of the Galactic Heroes re uh, references. He said to... Uh, how do we pronounce the C? Is just Kui? Kui uh, Jiaxi of Regiment Headquarters? Don't you think I am I put on a pretty good act? <clears throat> Chapter 12. Big Alliance. Number 1. Or part 1, or whatever. I assume Chapter 13 will be Big Alliance. Part 2? I don't know. <clears throat> Anyway, competition for public prestige as militant revolutionaries helped sustain and widen the split between the regiment and the fours, but the fuel that kept the factional fires burning day in and day out was the continuing repudiation of cadres back on the campus. Each week, both factions found cadres to criticize and expose and thus generated successive meetings. Without such meetings, the leaders could not have held their followers together. These repudiations did have some positive results. Some of the cadres were educated.
complicated. They were forced to think through their past acts and their class stand in the light of the two-line struggle that was emerging. But as for their students, the meetings rarely touched their souls, because they were used, in the main, for partisan purposes. A primary goal was to expose a cadre who had won the support of the other side, and thus condemn that side's politics. Secret investigations were carried out. This is just Kiwi Farms. Am I allowed to say the name of that website on Twitch? <laughs> oh shit. They're gonna go after me now. Gonna have to edit that out of the stream bot. <laughs> if damaging material was unearthed, it was quietly compiled and held in reserve until the right moment for sudden public exposure. The right moment being the one that would most deeply embarrass and confound the other side. Then the faction under attack would be accused of protecting a counter-revolutionary, which implied a counter-revolutionary intent on the part of its leaders. Did they not deserve, or not then deserve, a thousand lashes and a thousand deaths? None of this really helped misguided cadres to reform or young rebels to get at the truth. The real motto was not Mao's, cure the disease and save the patient, but do the other side in. As a result, the prestige of both factions fell among the masses, sensitive to the charge that they only repudiated cadres adhering to the opposite side. Each faction occasionally held a meeting to criticize one of their own. After this, members would shout, Who says we don't look into the problems on our own side? See, here's an example. But such tokens of criticism could hardly cover up the partisan nature of most of the activity. Late in the year, some people on both sides got tired of this infighting and started a campaign for the transformation of the old education at Tsinghua. They looked up material about Resistance University in Yunnan and made suggestions for applying that experience to their modern university. Realizing how divorced they had been from the working people and from production, the civil engineers worked out plans to carry on designing at various uh, work sites where the workers that too could be drawn in. Sacrificial lambs, great. <laughs> Who is Azazel in this situation? <laughs> I guess it's not a lamb, that's a goat. Whatever. Same thing. <laughs> They're different, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God. Same idea, though. Is it the same idea? No, it's not. My, my, my analogy was better. I think my analogy was better. I don't know. <clears throat> They're not quite the same. <sighs> Either way, it's meat. They'll do fine. Family. Family? What? <laughs> no, no, no. You don't eat the scapegoat. You just, you just send it out into the wilderness. And then later, the rabbis decided you had to drive it off a cliff. But that wasn't in the Torah. That, that, was, that was a later innovation. An innovation of Torah. I love that phrase. <laughs> what a phrase. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. <sighs> <sighs> Alright, let's see here. What did they do? What did they do? The civil engineers worked out plans to carry on designing at various work sites where the workers too could be drawn in. They also sent out teams uh, to investigate the graduates at their department. How they had done on actual jobs since leaving the university and what ideas they or their workmates had for changes in the educational system. The whole admission system, which recruited students like Little Tito and the special regulations that treated girls like debutantes, girls were not allowed to carry more than 55 pounds on construction sites, were also investigated. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, in America, nobody is allowed to carry more than 50 pounds by themselves. Uh, I think in general. Uh, except maybe in very i'm not sure if that's in general or if it's in most cases but anyway uh yeah osha regulations in general you're, you're not allowed to carry more than 50 pounds by yourself uh that's a violation if you do that um <sighs> 
but I, I, uh, I will however also say that the idea that women uh, can't carry more than 55 pounds ever is very silly uh, it's very very silly okay it's very silly <laughs> not gonna lie you've done that yeah it's it's a violation but your your boss won't care right your boss just wants you to get the shit done you know <sighs> 50 pounds is not particularly heavy okay look hold, hold on hold on let me just be right back this backpack over here. I have a 30 pound rock. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I gotta be over here. Okay. Okay, do you see 30 pounds you can buy sub crawl? Okay. 50 pounds isn't that heavy because you can use two hands when you're lifting 50 pounds. And then it's like nothing. I'm not even very strong. <laughs> I'm weak for a girl, apparently. I'm not sure if I should be happy about that for, like, gender euphoria reasons, or if I should be disappointed in myself for not being, for not, uh, keeping up with my protein intake and my, my workout <laughs> Y'all, I my one my one rep max of bench press is ninety pounds. I'm so fucking weak. <laughs> Y'all, what the hell? Oh boy, I don't even want to try deadlifting something. I'm scared of how small my one rep max is. It used to be three hundred pounds in high school. <laughs> the muscle atrophy from HRT is uh is really hitting me. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I can lift my own body weight with a deadlift yet right now. Oh god, I'd have to find out. I guess I'll find out. I'll try. I'll try at some point. I don't actually know. My my cable machine doesn't have uh, my body weight. It only goes up to 150 pounds. Damn it. <laughs> well, I'll try 150. I'll try to. I'll try. <laughs> Doing a 150 pound deadlift on the on the cable machine, which is easier than doing it on the with free weights. I know, I know, it's slightly easier because you don't need as many stabilizer muscles. But I, I, I anyway, I bet I can't even do that. Oh god, fuck! <laughs> oh man, how far I have fallen! <sighs> all right, all right. Let's see here. So anyway, um. For somebody who is working on a construction site, I feel like 55 pounds is not very much, is my point. <sighs> but only a minority of the students took part in this effort. The factional leaders were not interested. They maintained that without their proletarian, supposedly proletarian faction in power, all of this work would be lost. Since power was the crux of the whole question, it was idle to talk about specific reforms. Let's make sure the university is in the hands of the working class, i.e. our hands. Then we'll transform it, they said. Other students, growing sick of politics, took advantage of the confusion to retire to the library and read. The theory of technique in command thus showed up again as scores of people dropped out of political action and began pursuing careers on their own. Some studied mathematics, others studied foreign languages. They were voting with their feet against the senseless trend of events. In September 1967, after the high tide of attacks on PLA headquarters had abated and the foreign ministry had returned to Joe and Liza's control. Y'all, it's only been like two years. We've just barely started. This has been like one or two years since all this shit started. Oh my god. A powerful movement in favor of big alliances and an end to factionalism swept the whole nation. Mao Zedong returned from an extended southern trip and stated unequivocally, there is no conflict of fundamental interest within the working class. This is generally true, yes. Under the dictatorship of the proletariat, there is no reason whatsoever for the working class to split into two big and irreconcilable groupings. Oh no, what did everyone ignore for those years? <laughs> 
Everywhere, rank-and-file people, sick of factional struggle, seized on this directive to demand unity. In Nanjing, the whole city was covered with reconciliation posters. Members of the Make Wind faction, still not going to get over the name, who had been driven beyond the city limits were welcomed back. Meetings were held in every work unit and school to dissolve splits and create a single revolutionary organization of the masses. A similar tide of unity swept Shanghai, Hangzhou, Guangzhou, and Beijing. Tsinghua University could hardly ignore the trend. The factional leaders, meeting separately in urgent sessions, felt great pressure from below. Mao Zedong himself uh, had initiated the January storm in Shanghai. Now he was calling for big alliances. If a group did not go along, how could it maintain a position of leadership? Strong pressures came from above. The Central Cultural Revolution Group called in the Tsinghua student leaders and told them, the whole country is forming alliances. How long can you go on quarreling? If you don't get together and decide on some form of coalition, we won't let you join in the National Day celebrations. After this, the Force Headquarters Committee decided in favor of alliance. But they did not know how to proceed. Kuai Dafu had never recognized the Force as, as a legitimate organization. How could they make an alliance with him? The remnant or sorry, regiment leaders, rising to the occasion, finally put out a statement that they recognized the Force as a legal organization. They suggested talks and a coalition headquarters. Since Kuai had taken the initiative, we too had to seize the time, said Wang Yongxian of the Force. As Kuai walked over to negotiate, we beat drums and cymbals to welcome him and invited him with enthusiasm. We held the talks in the Agricultural Engineering Building, not far from the big campus statue of Chairman Mao. The one that he hated. Once again. <clears throat> Look at all the statues of me. There I am, standing out there alone in the cold and the rain. Mao Zedong. The masses lined up on both sides of the road to welcome them. Our negotiations lasted two days. In all the time, the people outside cheered us on. We agreed on a coalition headquarters without too much trouble, since Kuai, as a nationally known student leader, was already on the standing committee of the Beijing Revolutionary Committee, we decided to be generous and let him hold first place in our committee, but we stipulated that if the regiment held the chairman's seat, 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 then the fours had to hold the next post, and so on in alternation. We insisted on complete balance and equality between our two sides. As for the name of the new coalition, it was to be called the Jingangshan Regiment General Service Station. When the masses outside heard that an agreement had been reached, they held a tumultuous celebration, cheering, shouting, and dancing in the street. But when we returned to our headquarters, certain rods among the fours were very upset. How come you have, called, you have called it a regiment service station? It seems as if we fours have been completely dissolved. Where is the coalition here? They convinced Shan Ru Huai that the new organization should be called general headquarters, not a service station. So, in the afternoon, we went to find Kuai and asked him to change the name before we made any final declaration or held any public ceremony. Already, people from far beyond the campus had come to take part in our or unity celebration, and the masses of both factions had assembled in front of the main building, impatient for the proceedings to begin. Right then and there, we quarreled. Kuai said the agreement had already been signed. How could it be changed? We said, what's in a name? Why not change it to show that this is a real alliance? There is no question of principle involved here. The argument delayed the meeting. Many people jumped onto the stage and asked why nothing had started. The radio had already broadcast the news of Tsinghua's big alliance, and reporters had come out of the city to write it all up. And not only reporters, but photographers as well. In the end, uh, Kwai relented. He made a concession. He agreed to call our new organization the coalition headquarters. So the meeting began. But the atmosphere was not good. When one side spoke, the other side would not applaud. Some who had planned to speak refused to do so. The masses could clearly see from the long delay and from the ill will expressed by the two sides, or sorry, expressed that the two sides were still at odds. In the end, the meeting broke up, leaving a sour taste in the mouth. Of course, we fours were to blame. It was we who insisted on changing the name at the last minute, and this created resentment all around. But if we were bad, the regiment was no better. They said, whoever tears up the agreement is Chiang Kai-shek. <sighs> Shen, uh, Shen Ru Huai tore up the agreement. Therefore, Shen Ru Huai is Chiang Kai-shek. <sighs> I 
I, I don't think wanting to change the name of the 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 coalition thing is equivalent to committing literal genocide but okay sure yeah reducto ad chiang kai shek <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thus, on September 21st, the Qinghua Big Alliance got off to a shaky start. A period of uneasy truce uh, followed during which there were no more big quarrels or fights. Rank and file members of the two factions joined the National Day celebrations together, formed real, assi or, sorry, formed real alliances in the university departments, and went off en masse to join the fall harvest. Joint, offices, joint offices and working committees were set up, and some of them worked together without incident for months. No public statements were made, which were not signed by both sides. But for a long time, the leading committee of four, two from the regiment and two from the fours, could not be expanded, because no agreement on personnel could be reached. Finally, under great pressures from below, a standing committee of thirty was chosen. Under it, joint classes for political study were started, and the transformation of the university was discussed. But factional activity simmered dangerously just below the surface now and then, or and now and then broke into the open. A constant source of friction was the force support of the cadre Tan Haoqiang. Tan was an officer of the Communist Youth League at the university, who, after the Cultural Revolution uh, began, had compiled 100 examples of Liu Xiaqi's statements opposing Mao Zedong. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a little note from the editor. Here, uh, 53, 53, 53. Uh, somebody must be mentioned. Where is footnote number 53? Oh, down here. So the author here, uh, or the editor, I'm, 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 okay. I'm not sure which one is the correct one, but there's this, the person they're arguing over, uh, is either called Tan Hao Chiang or Dan Shun. They're two different people, and the editor thinks that the author might have messed up here and said the wrong name. And I'm wondering if Tan Hao Chiang is the correct name that the editors have put in, and then put, added a footnote to say that they changed it from Dan Shun, or if they're saying that Tan Hao Chiang is what Bill put in, and the editor is saying that actually this should have said Dan Shun here. I'm not sure which is correct. So it's one of those two people. <laughs> can't I can't figure out what they're trying to say in terms of which one is I don't know, I don't know. Anyway. <sighs> huh. Alright. Bill is Bill is dead now, so we can't ask him. I guess. <sighs> When did he die? Like, relatively recently? I know that his sister died in the early 2000s. He died in 2004 as well. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Joan died... When did his sister die? Let's see here. <laughs> Let's see, Joan died in 2010, his sister, uh, and when did Joan's husband, or where did, where did Sid, when did Sid die? 2003. So Sid died in 2003, Bill died in 2004, and Joan died in 2010. Anyway. <sighs> All right, let's see here. Continuing. Let's see here. So... They had compiled a hundred examples of Liu Xiaoqi's statements opposing Mao Zedong. These selected quotes showed Liu stating, or saying the opposite of what Mao was advocating at the time. Or, uh, they were reviewed by the Central Committee and finally approved, making Tan very well known. When the time came to end the isolation of the cadres and pull good ones back into the struggle, both sides wanted to win Tan's support. Tan himself preferred the fours. As soon as Tan took his step, the regiment pe began to attack him. They singled him out for particular attention, since he was more important than a public figure than the others, or as a public as a public figure than the others. Kwai wrote him an open letter, making fun of his stand and ending with his message: "If you go on like this, you will end up as a die-hard capitalist rotor." 
Um, okay, maybe we could just try looking up these names since they might be slightly famous. All right, let's try looking up uh, Tan Ha Chiang first. And then we'll look up uh, Nan Shan. Okay, so uh, apparently uh, Tan Ha Chiang is also the name of a guy who wrote a, a bunch of programming textbooks in the 19... 70s and 80s or something i don't know <laughs> about this he wrote some shit i don't know anyway or maybe yeah i don't know the 80s anyway i think this is a different person uh than what we're looking for let me try searching uh dan shun now dan shun dan shun Is a perennial herb that grows on sunny hillsides and stream edges in China. No. <laughs> I'm trying to find the guy. Yeah, these names are impossible to find, y'all. You cannot look up these names. Good luck. I don't think we're talking about the about the programming textbook author uh, Tan Hia Chiang, probably a different one, or Dan Shun the plant. Dunshan the person, which is a very generic name. I got it. <laughs> oh boy, okay, anyway. So anyway, the attack by the regiment was all Tan needed to, it's either Tan or Dun, we don't know which, <laughs> needed to win out, or to win all su all out support from the Fours. The Fours not only recruited him into their faction, but they made him a member of their headquarters committee. When the coalition headquarters was set up in September, they wanted him on that headquarters group as well. Kawai, speaking for the regiment, agreed the Fours list with one ex or to the Fours list with one exception, Tan. The Fours replied that Tan was the man they wanted. This demand we will not drop. The two sides quarreled bitterly, and the quarrel went on and on. It was finally settled by an agreement that Tan could sit on the committee if he made a self-criticism before the masses, and if his self-criticism was accepted. Later, he did go out before mass meetings more than once, but the listeners were not satisfied with his self-criticism, and his status was never officially settled. Nevertheless, the Fours brought him along to coalition headquarters each time, and each time the regiment challenged his right to be there. These challenges continued until the headquarters broke up. The issue was never settled. Even more serious than the chronic dispute over Tan was the action taken by a group of iron rods at the regiment who quite illegally set up a fight to self uh, repudiate revisionism liaison station uh, uh, dedicated to fighting the self interest of Kwai Dafu and repudiating the revisionism of the Fours. And what was uh, Kawhi's self-interest, the compromises he had made in order to get agreement on a coalition headquarters. The charge was that, in order to be elected leader of the United Movement, Kawhi had sacrificed principle. Oh boy. You know what, we could check actually, the appendix at the end of the book might have further notes about this. Either Dan Shun or Tan... What, what's his name? How <laughs> young? Uh, let's let's uh, let's see here. We're on page two hundred thirty-one. Let's check the appendix at the end with the giant list of names uh, here. All right, hold on. Da, 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 da. Is this supposed to be alphabetical? I, I don't think I don't think our person is here, y'all. No. He's not here, y'all. He's not here. Great. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Great, go. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> I can't find any... Maybe there's a list here? We're, we're talking about 1967. Later. The Coalition. There's... there's Fight Self-Repudiate Revisionism Liaison Station. Uh, 
There's no mention of this person in this section, in the appendix. Damn it. <laughs> All right, back to page 231. Okay. <sighs> so anyway. When the Coalition headquarters was set up in September, they wanted him on that headquarters group as well. Kwai, speaking for the regiment, agreed to the Four's list with one exception. Tan. The Four's replied that Tan was the man they wanted. This demand we will not drop. The two sides quarreled bitterly, and the quarrel went on and on. It was finally settled by an agreement that Tan could sit on the committee if he made a self-criticism before the masses, and if his self-criticism was accepted. Later, he did go out for a mass meeting more than once, but the listeners were not satisfied with his self-criticism, and his status was never officially settled. Nevertheless, the force brought him along to coalition headquarters each time, and each time the regiment challenged his right to be there. These challenges continued until the headquarters broke up. The issue was, the issue was never settled. Even more serious than the chronic dispute over Tan was the action taken by a group of iron rods but from the regiment who quite illegally set up a fight self repudiate revisionism liaison station dedicated to re fighting the self-interest of Kawai Dafu and repudiating the revisionism of the fours. And what was Kawai's self-interest? The compromises he had made in order to get an ag agreement on a coalition headquarters. The charge was that, in order to be elected leader of the united movement, Kawai had sacrificed principle. Right, okay, now we're back up to speed. Okay. Kawai himself, not long after National Day, had met with Chi Ban Yu. Chi had asked him about the alliance. Can this be a real alliance? How can you unite so quickly? A hundred years ago, Marx called on the workers to unite, but it hasn't happened yet. Is it all so easy? Mao had said that if the two student factions are revolutionary, then they should unite on the basis of revolutionary principles. Chi raised questions concerning the basis of the new student unity. He implied that the Qinghua alliance was based not on revolutionary principle, but on expediency. When Kwai got back to the campus, he initiated a wide discussion among the regiment militants around this issue. The majority decided that what they had formed was a political monstrosity, an alliance for alliance's sake. So they set up their fight self repudiate revisionism liaison station, and factional struggle broke out into the open with renewed vigor. Soon, some of the joint offices and united working committees broke down. Among the first to go was the Joint Office of Records. Soon after the coalition was formed, both sides had pulled their files and records in one building and had put the single or a single person in charge. The man selected for this job was a member of the force. When the regiment militants decided that the big alliance was unprincipled, they also decided that they could not trust one of the fours to handle the records. What if he should deny the regiment people access while allowing the fours unlimited use of his office? They decided to regain control of their files and records clandestinely. One evening, two young men from the regiment went into the record keeper's office and asked if they could use his phone. He, of course, had no reason to object. What he did not know was that they already had removed the receiver from the phone they were calling, so that each time they dialed, they got a busy signal. While waiting for their line to clear, the two regiment stalwarts engaged the record keeper in conversation. And since the phone at the other end continued to be busy, the conversation went on for a long time. While the record keeper was thus engaged in an apparent innocent conversation, another group of regiment rods crept upstairs with pliers and screwdrivers, picked the lock on the records room, broke the locks off the filing cabinet drawers, loaded all the papers into twenty book bags, and made off with them. This after carefully sweeping the floor and replacing everything in such good order that the room appeared undisturbed. When on the following day the record keeper discovered the papers were gone, including those belonging to the fours, the regiment was ready with a poster expressing indignation at this serious stealing incident. The fours headquarters committee, knowing that none of their members had a hand on it, suspected the regiment had filed a strong protest. They demanded a thorough investigation, but the regiment responded with another strong statement denouncing the criminal act. To outsiders, the wording made it appear that they suspected class enemies, perhaps hidden among the fours, perhaps coming in from off the campus. Oh, I... This trickery fooled many ordinary people, who were quite ready to believe that counter-revolutionaries had chosen this method to try and break up the big alliance. But it didn't fool the leaders of the fours. They knew the regiment had made off with the papers, and the regiment's leaders knew they knew it. It was a major disruptive blow. Chapter 13. Split. Again! <laughs> Oh boy.
As if the alliance at Tsinghua was not shaky enough, on December 17th, uh, Qi Wenyu stepped in to fan the flames. The occasion was a meeting of student leaders from several Beijing universities who had been called together to discuss educational transformation. Here, Qi not only threw him su or his support to the regiment, but he simultaneously attacked the fours for their choice of a song. The big alliance at Tsinghua, said Qi, Qi, Tsinghua, Qi, okay, Qi, 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 must have the regiment at its core. This had been uh, decided by history, but the reality of the current struggle, uh, or by the reality of the current struggle, of course, he went on, uh, uh, regiment people should be modest and avoid arrogance. As for the fours, they should admit the leading position of the regiment. This is not my opinion. It is not something that was decided by me or you. It is simply an objective fact. By stating the matter thus, Qi Wenyu implied that the Central Committee and Chairman Mao concurred in this view. Delighted by Qi's open support for her faction, the regiment delegate at the meeting, a young woman named Chun Yuyan, asked Qi for an opinion about the Four's battle song, the words of which, according to the Four's, came directly from Lin Biao. According to the regiment, no such words had ever been spoken by Lin. The controversial verse went for like this. I don't know how the song goes, but we'll make one up. I guess, I don't know. Sometimes one may s oh sorry. <clears throat> Sometimes one must face sacrifice. One must even sacrifice one's life. If I get finished off, I'm finished. When the shooting stars on the battlefield, I make a resolution. Today lousy dies in this place. I don't know, yo. Yeah. To refer to oneself as a lousy, literally your old man, is a form of oath. It implies that you are the father of everyone who is listening. Hence, you are calling them all bastards. <clears throat> it is a tough, devil-may-care way of speaking for or speaking about oneself quite typical of soldiers in battle, but quite shocking to the ordinary civilian listener. An English equivalent might be, today your motherfucking uncle dies. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> when asked if this was really a quote from Li Biao, Qi said, there was no such quote. Analyze it with Mao Zedong thought. How could Li Biao have used such words? That's what we have been saying, responded Chun Yuyan, delighted. But they say we are spreading rumors and slandering them. No, said Qi. They are spreading the rumors. They are the criminals. When Qi's words reached the campus, they created a great stir. Chun Yuyan, uh, Yuyan uh, coming home exhausted, told her comrades briefly about what had been said, then went to bed. When Kui Defu returned much later in the evening and heard the news, he was overjoyed. We must broadcast it right away, he said. But Chun has gone to sleep, and so has everyone else, said the headquarters personnel. Why don't we wait until the morning? Good news from on high can't be delayed, Kui insisted. Such good tidings must be spread at once. He sent a car out to bring Chun back and immediately went on the air himself, shouting, Good news, the best news! An important speech by central leaders. Pay everyone, ev pay attention, everyone. After Chun reported the details, Kwai took the microphone once more. This is the Central Committee speaking. This is history. This is the proletarian headquarters backing us up. The regiment people among his listeners all clapped and cheered. They clapped till their hands hurt. Ow, fuck. Mao Zedong stands behind us. We must follow him to the end. Mao never said anything, y'all. He didn't say anything about standing behind you. Shut the fuck up. Only Qi Bunyu said that, man. God. The Fours, on the other hand, had been taken by surprise and felt betrayed. Although they too had a delegate, or had had a delegate at the meeting, they knew nothing about what had happened until they heard Kwai filling the night air with his exultation. They immediately rushed out to find their delegate and, a delegate and asked him if it was true. Did Qi Bunyu say that? Yes, said the bewildered youth. He said all of that. This made the Defors very angry. They were angry at Chi's words, and they were angry because the man from for the Fours who had been invited to attend the meeting was such a strange, withdrawn person. He had invented a kind of brush for painting posters. When posters were being produced, he always appeared, laid his tools out on the ground, and helped uh, everyone with their writing. A queer duck! Now he had let them down. Great phrase there. A queer duck.
Thank you, Bill. The regiment was on the offensive in the middle of the night, and the fours had prepared no counter move. The fours headquarters committed uh, our committee called an emergency meeting then and there. As for the regiment being the corps, they decided that was easy to rebut. Had not Mao Zedong said that to think you are the center is childish? He was correct to say that. Yes, he did say that, and he was correct. Yes, anyone who calls himself the center is in violation of Mao Zedong thought. I mean, yeah, actually. And as for the and, and common sense, and as for Lin Biao quote or the Lin Biao quote, they had certainly not made it up, and they resolved to track it down. Sure enough, after an intensive search, they found it printed in a booklet put out by one faction in a People's Liberation Army school. Having made sure of their position, the fours mounted a counteroffensive against the regiment. They put, they put posters all over the campus and all over the city, saying, "What do you mean? I am the core? What a stupid anti-Mao statement!" And they all called a big meeting for December 18th to hammer this point home and to defend their battle song. Oh boy. <laughs> big stretch. <laughs> At the meeting. Chun Chu San, an articulate leader of the, of the fours, said, Some accuse us of spreading rumors. Who dares say that now? Here is a book printed under the supervision of the chief of staff, printed in black and white, and it contains the words of our song. This really upset some of the people who were listening. Obviously, the regiment militants had spread lies and slander. Now was the time to let them suffer a thousand lashings, let them die a thousand deaths. But the regiment did not take these charges passively. As soon as Chun had finished speaking, they denounced him for attacking the proletarian headquarters of the Central Committee, for attacking Chi Bun Yu. Then, on December 20th, they seized Chun Chu San, held him prisoner, and called a mass meeting to repudiate him as a counter-revolutionary. Of course, the fours cannot allow such a meeting to proceed unchallenged. They rallied their ranks, showed up in force, and occupied the meeting site, hoping to prevent the proceedings from ever getting underway. A struggle began over control of the microphones. Soon, fist fighting spread to the audience. While the rank and file fought it out, Kwai whisked uh, Chun away to the city and turned him over to the security police. The police held him for investigation on the strength of Kwai's accusations, and the big alliance broke up for good, which was, of course, what Kwai wanted. When the fours heard that Chun was under arrest, they were very angry. How can anyone just grab people like that? They mobilized several thousand supporters, who marched into the city, sh uh, shouting, Give us back Comrade Chun! They gathered first in front of the security bureau, then left 200 to negotiate Chun's release. I like how we suddenly uh, have his name as uh, Jun instead of Chun. I don't know what's going on here. It's, it's typo, probably. Uh, while the rest marched out uh, to uh, Zhongnanhai to find Qi Ban Yu. They never found Qi, but they did find some leaders of the security bureau. They confronted them with strong demands for the release of Chun, and set up a liaison station outside the Bureau's main gate to handle the protesters who continued to show up. Angry crowds gathered in such numbers that police work was disrupted. <sighs> Remember, folks, we outnumber the police massively. <clears throat> The regiment responded with a mass meeting and a huge demonstration to celebrate the anniversary of the great N.T. Liu parade of December 25th, 1966. It was advertised as a movement to overcome obstructions to the 9th Congress of the Communist Party, which everyone thought would soon take place. On posters and at the meeting, regiment writers and speakers denounced, the adverse current that is trying to make us rebels stink. Uh, and slander us so that Chi Ban Yu cannot get elected to the political bureau, and young rebels of merit cannot get elected to the central committee. One noon, the broadcast openly said, People are slandering us. They want to prevent our being elected to the central committee. This made the fours laugh. Laugh, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, how could Kwai be elected to the Central Committee? He wasn't even a member of the Communist Party. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, don't you usually have to be elected to the Communist Party first? That's, that's how it is now, I believe. 
Uh, being elected to the Communist Party is a big deal, by the way. Uh, there are a lot of members of the Communist Party, but uh, generally they are elected positions. Uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong. Maybe that maybe it was like that before, and now it's not. I don't know. But I, I yeah. Anyway, did I? What in the fuck? You all know, oh my god. Okay, anyway. Don't worry about it. Uh, on December 26th, Vice Premier Xie, uh, Xie, Xie, Xie Fuji, Fu, wait, it's not G, it's Fuji, Fuji, Fuji. That's so hard to say. Oh my god. Xie Fuji received delegates from both factions at his office in the city. In the audience sat Chun Shusun, who had been released unconditionally. Qi Bun Yu stepped forward with a written speech. This time, he said, I'm going to read my speech so that none of you can grab a single straw for factional purposes. Among the topics which he then took up was the Four's Battle Song. Lin Biao did once say those words, he said, reversing his opinion of a few weeks before. The fact that the Fours used them for their battle song shows their great love for Lin Biao and for Chairman Mao. Now it was time for the Fours to celebrate. Our leaders called me from the city and informed us that Chun had been released, said Wang, uh... Yongxian of the forest. So I organized a welcoming crowd that stretched far beyond the school grounds. Our gathering was as big as the one that had, assemb had assembled to hear Chi Yu's remarks when he praised the regiment. So now we had our turn. Now we drew the crowd. Oh, boy. But after this conflict, or after this, the conflict between us and the regiment grew sharper and sharper. The sinister hand of Chi Bun Yu had caused both sides to make mistakes. He led us into head-on collision. Yeah, this is this is very typical of of the Cultural Revolution in general, of higher ups in the party, like playing both sides of various factional disputes uh, in order to make the disputes worse in ways that would help. Uh, raise up their own personal position, you know, politically. Very common at that time. <sighs> the speech in uh, Xie Fuji's office, Fuji, 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 Zhe, 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 Fuji, I think, the office. <laughs> was uh, Qi's last official act. Early in 1968, he disappeared from public life, exposed by his own manipulations as an ultra-left troublemaker. Fair enough. The unstable coalition between the regiment and the fours broke up completely after the regiment seized Chun Chusan and turned him over to the security police. Chun Chusan's release did not repair the breach. On the contrary, it sharpened the antagonism between the two factions because it put the regiment on the defensive politically, a position that for Kwai Dafu was both unusual and intolerable. Kwai was already on the defensive at this time because of his close ties with Qi Wen Yu and his all-out support for Chun Li Ning, the quote madman of the modern age, who was under investigation at the Central Committee level. In order to recoup prestige, the regiment took the offensive. In January 1968, its forces kidnapped two former university cadres who were active in the force organization and held them prisoner. The two cadres, Luo, uh, Luo? Zhong Qi and Li Kang were charged with counter-revolutionary activity and were tortured by their captors in order to obtain confessions that could be used to expose the fours. Regiment rods made Luo and Li stand against the wall of a room, each holding a stool at arm's length in his right hand. They had to stand until they agreed to sign attacks on Mao Zedong and the proletarian headquarters, uh, which had been drafted for them. If the prisoner's hand would sink even slightly, he was beaten with a stick until he either raised the stool to horizontal position again or collapsed on the floor. Until this kind of treatment, repeated day after day, or under this kind of treatment, the two cadres finally signed the material forced upon them, and their confessions were then used to prove that the force harbored a counter-revolutionary clique at its very center. Believing the 
confessions of Luo and Li insuff insufficient to prove their case. On April 14th, the regiment kidnapped two more cadres from the ranks of the forest. A man named Wen Xu, uh, Shui Mei, Shui, sorry, Shui Mi, Shui Mi, and a woman named Rao Wei Qi. Wait, how do you, is the C? I still know what the C is. Wei Qi? I don't know. The, these two, uh, they held and tortured in the same way, and in due course extracted confessions even more damning than the revelations attributed to Luo and Li. Thus, the myth of the Luo Wan Li Rao counter revolutionary conspiracy was born. The Fours retaliated on April 20th by sieging, seizing a cadre who belonged to the regiment, Wen Tao Sun. This so angered the regiment militants that they issued an ultimatum. Return Tao Sun within 48 hours or suffer the consequences. The consequences were to be a general attack on the buildings held by the Fours. Fearing the attack, the Fours began to fortify the science building, their main stronghold. At the same time, they broadcast an announcement that anyone coming within 50 meters of this building would be seized. When a regiment fighter inadvertently crossed the line, he was captured and held prisoner. This was the incident the regiment had been waiting for. On the next day, April 23rd, the regiment launched an offensive against the meeting hall, a strategic location at the north of the, entr at the north end of the central oval that had been or that had until then been frequently used, but never permanently occupied by the fours. Oh, I, I don't, I'm really not understanding the reviews of this book that people were saying that it was like, I don't know, too many details about this one specific university. Y'all, how can you not like this book? How can you not read this and be like, extremely interested? It's so, there's so much wacky shit going on. How can you not want to read it? What? How can you find this book boring? There's nothing boring in this book. <laughs> At least so far, we're halfway through it and I haven't found anything boring yet. <laughs> Sheesh, anyway. Oh boy. It just gets wilder and wilder, y'all. <clears throat> As an excuse for their action, the regiment claimed that 400 spears had been stored there. This was a lie to which the regiment- They have weapons of mass destruction. God, I can't, I can't, Fucking hell. <laughs> Such a window into the culture. It's great like that. This is, this is this book is great at illustrating that the Cultural Revolution was absolutely wild, but not in the ways that most Westerners think. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Westerners have a very, very propagandized view of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was wild, all right. But uh, it was a bit different than what people actually think over here, you know. <laughs> Um, oh boy. So anyway, the regiment claimed that Saddam had 400 spears stored in that way. Uh, sorry. There was <laughs> that the fours had weapons of mass destruction stored in the... Okay, sorry. <clears throat> that the fours had 400 spears which had been stored there. There, I finally got it right. <clears throat> this was a lie to which the regiment lent credence by sending a very small student through the utility tunnels into the building. Fuck is this mission impossible shit. When he came back, he reported spears everywhere. Morally buttressed by the alleged warlike preparations in forest territory, Kwai Dafu order, ordered the regiment to attack. Oh my... Postmortems in Beijing in 1971 tended toward the conclusion that the escalation of the factional struggle into open warfare in April 1968 could not be explained in terms of campus issues alone. It was not a spontaneous development of the student movement. Kuai Dafu's attack was planned and carried through after the exposure of the Yang Yufu clique at the central command level in the People's Liberation Army. Yang Chengwu had been the chief of staff of the army. Yu Lijing had been the political director of the Air Force, while Fu Chongbi had commanded the Beijing garrison.
They were removed from their commands in March 1968 because they were members of the ultra-left May 16th group, just as Wang Li, Guan Feng, and Xi Ben Yu had earlier been removed from the Central Cultural Revolution group. This put the May 16th forces in a desperate position. It was necessary to create a diversion, if possible even a provocation, which would put Mao Zedong's proletarian headquarters on the spot, force it to intervene in the student movement, expose it to attack, and thus give May the, or the May 16th group a chance to regroup. Kwai Dafu was apparently chosen as the one to do the job. <sighs> oh boy. Whether Kwai was a conscious member of the May 16th group or only an ambitious rebel with ultra-left politics remains unclear. Whatever his subjective state, objectively he seems to have colluded in a plan to provoke violence and to have carried it through systematically. Starting in March, he made several attempts to persuade the regiment to take up arms, but though he agreed most of his iron, or sorry, he carried most of his iron rods with him, he failed to persuade the rank and file, and his plans were therefore rejected. On April 22nd, at a special meeting in the Aeronautics Building, he tried once again. This time, he made, no, he made sure no objectors came to the meeting by inviting only those he was sure of and he personally, or by personally standing guard at the door. After calling the meeting to order, he said that the exposure of Yang, Yu, and Fu proved that there were counter-revolutionary conspirators at the highest level. Oh, why? Their campus equivalent was the force. Now, uh, reason no longer works, declared Kwai in his persuasive oratorical style. We have to move on to armed struggle. Once the fighting starts, if a red hand intervenes, it will support us. If a black hand intervenes, it will expose it. By a red hand, he presumably meant Chen Boda, later exposed as a leader of the ultra-left. By a black hand, he meant Zhou Enlai. This is a struggle between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party. Not again. Not again. It can never be settled with mere words. Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> here we go again. When several of his stalwarts objected that it was almost May 1st, an important national holiday, and that they would be severely criticized for starting any fighting at such a time, Kwai replied, Never mind, the fighting will only last three days. We'll wipe them out, and it will be all over before the festival. The Central Committee will support us. Bro. Bro. These arguments carried the day. The rest of the meeting was devoted to specific plans for seizing the meeting hall and for laying down the propaganda screen that would win sympathy for the regiment. The propaganda was issued for the Aeronautical Institute, where a small group of regiment militants met to write an appeal to the Central Committee. The Luo Wen Li Rao clique had forced matters to a head, they proclaimed. Faced with this intolerable situation, we have taken up arms. There is an old Chinese saying that the devil makes the first appeal. The regiment, having decided to take the offensive, bombarded the public with material that put all the blame on the fours. Meanwhile, Kwai, having set up everything up, left the campus. <laughs> Bye! <clears throat> Erdogan, every time he does a self-coup. God, God, <laughs> In case of the er, in case the fighting backfired, in case the Central Committee blamed the regiment, Kwai would be in the clear. He could not hold, be held responsible for events that occurred in his absence. Oh yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> 